Let's turn now to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 30. Which book are we going to? Exodus. We're going to the book of uh, Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30, beginning uh, in verse uh, 18. Exodus chapter 18. Again, uh, we are continuing the study on the, on the sanctuary. We are at this time uh, looking at uh, one other item that we find uh, in the sanctuary. And this item is, uh, who can guess this item we are looking at here? It's the laver. Amen. We are looking at the laver. Are you there? Exodus chapter 30, verse 18, and the Bible says, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass. Of what? Of brass. of brass. And his food also of brass, to wash with all. So what was the purpose of the laver? For cleansing. For cleansing, to wash. And it says, to wash with all, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. So according to what the Bible says here, where was uh, the uh, laver placed? Where did they place, where did they put the laver? Between the tabernacle. Between uh, the, that's right, between the tabernacle and the altar. Which altar is that referring to? Which altar? It's referring to the altar of sacrifice. Again, one more time, verse 18. Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his food also of brass to wash withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. So we are seeing here that uh, the very next thing that the priest will do after the priest assists the sinner with uh, sacrificing this animal, slaying the throat of this animal, the very next thing that the priest will do, the priest will go towards the, the tabernacle. It, it is called the tabernacle of congregation. But the priest could not enter that tabernacle without uh, cleansing, washing himself. Hence the reason why the laver was placed between the altar and uh, the tabernacle. So before he enters in there, that's inside of the holy place, he must wash himself, which uh, represent the closer we get to Jesus Christ, the nearer we get to Christ, amen, we must be clean, we must be washed, and which also s signifies the washing away of sin. It was not enough for just uh, Jesus, which remember now, this also represents Jesus' death and burial. The washing, the baptism there, represent Jesus' death and burial. So it wasn't just enough for Jesus to die for us on the cross. Jesus had to be buried. Amen? You understand this? Jesus had to be buried. And now what does the burial of Jesus Christ represent? It represents the burial of our sins. Because remember, all our sins were placed upon Him at that time. And so when he died on the cross and then he went to the tomb and was buried, he buried our sins into the, the ground, into, into the grave. Hence, it reminds me of a passage where God says to Adam and Eve, after they sin against God, God says that thus you are, where, what would happen to you? To, to the dust you would return, right? Until now until the resurrection day. Amen? That represent that when we die, brothers and sisters, we are talking about the physical death here. When we died and we are buried, the Bible says we return back to the ground. We, 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 we turn into dust because that's what we once were. That's where God took us out of. But it also represents the, the dying to self. So when Jesus comes again, as the Bible tells us in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says that when Christ comes again, uh, the dead will come back to life when they hear the voice of the Son of, of, uh, Son of God. And the 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us that when Jesus comes again, this corruption must put on incorruption. So the, the corruption there represent the, the dust, represent us that turns into dust and go back into the dust. But was it God's plans for us to go back into dust originally? 
to go back to where we came from originally. Was it God's plan? No, it was not God's plan. But because of sin, we must return to the dust. Amen? We must die to self. We must uh, inherit an incorruptible body in order to live in the presence of God. So back now to the passage. So the priest must wash himself. But remember now, he assisted the sinner before he enters the sanctuary, before he goes into the holy place. He had just uh, finished, assisted the sinner with uh, slaying the throat of this animal, but he catches the blood of the animal. But even though the priest did not himself touch the blood, but the fact that he's carrying the blood, are you with me? But the fact that he's carrying the blood, he, it was all, uh, uh, he, it signifies that he, the priest represent you and I going to the presence of God guilty with blood in his hand. You understand what that means? We all, all of us have blood in our hands. What blood am I referring to? Sin. Not just the blood of sin, but the blood of the Son of God. Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Remember, it was a sinner that slayed the throat of the animal as we look at here in this picture. It was the sinner that, that slain the throat of the animal. But remember, the, the sinner could not come in the presence of God. The, he, ha, he had to have a mediator, but that mediator represents the sinner. It represents me. It represents you. So therefore now, since uh, the priest now represents the sinner, so the, the likewise, because I was the one who cut the throat of the animal, but now that priest is my representative, so that means that priest is guilty. You understand what I'm saying? That means the priest is guilty so the, because he, he represented me. So he has blood in his hands. Amen? He has blood in his hands. I cut the throat. So he proceeded to say, okay, I'm going to represent you. I'm your mediator. So he has blood in his hand. So he is guilty. So I go free, but that priest now is guilty. Amen? Because he represent me who just finished cutting the throat of that animal. So hence the reason why the Bible says again in verse 18 that he must wash himself. And that represents, the, the, having blood in his hands represents sin. It was uh, Abel, Cain and Abel rather, it was Cain who slew Abel. And the blood of Abel was crying from the ground. Let's look at another passage that confirms that he had blood in his hands and he needed to wash his hands. Let's go now to the book of Isaiah, which was our scripture reading. The book of Isaiah chapter 1. We're going to the book of Isaiah chapter 1. Are you turning to your Bibles, young people? Yeah. Isaiah chapter 1, notice now in verse 15. Isaiah chapter 1. And the Bible says, give you a, give you a moment to get there. Isaiah chapter 1. All right, Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. And the Bible says, And when ye spread forth your hands, notice the word hands there, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear your hands are what? A full of blood. Hence, here it is. So your, our hands are full of blood. So in order for God to accept our worship, to come before Him, we must cleanse ourselves. Hence, the reason why the priest had to wash himself. But it wasn't just himself now that he had to, uh, or his hands now he had to wash. Go back now to uh, where we were. Exodus chapter 30. Go back to Exodus chapter 30. It wasn't just his hands that he had to wash. We'll come back to Isaiah again. But notice now in verse 19 now, and the Bible says in Exodus chapter 30 verse 19, for Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their, what else? Their feet there at when, when they go into the tabernacle of the congregation. They shall wash with water. 
that they died not. Then it says, all, when they come near to the altar to minister to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord, so they shall wash their hands and their feet, that they died not, and it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generation. So what was the reason why God says specifically that they had to wash both their hands and their feet. What was the reason why? So that they would not die because they had to come, how? In the presence of, of the Holy God. Cleanse. And that represents all of us. And that represents baptism. Baptism represents cleansing from our sin before we can enter into the holy place to come nearer to, to God. We must cleanse this body. Back now to Isaiah again. Notice uh, the significance again uh, one more time. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. Back to verse uh, 15 again. Again it says, And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Why? What? Because your hands are full of blood. Now notice the counsel there. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the what? The evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Sends hands. When the priest washes his hands on my behalf, on your behalf, not in, the, in his behalf now, because remember he's going in there because of me, because of my sin. So w the Bible says, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil. So the washing of the hands and of the feet represent putting away the evil. Amen. So baptism represents the putting away of the evil. Verse 18, verse 18 says, come now and let us reason not what? Together. So as we hear the counsel to come to God, to wash ourselves, wash our feet, wash our hands, to be submerged into the water of baptism, God is calling us, is uh, appealing to us to come and reason. Why should we come to God to reason? Because he says in verse 18 again, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as uh, scarlet, they shall be as uh, white as snow. Though they be red like grimstone, they shall be as wool. What color is wool? White. White. So God wants us to make us pure as wool. Verse 19, notice now. It says, if ye be, what's the word? Willing and obedient. So notice now, God will not force me to come to Him. God will not force you to come. He's appealing to us. If he's appealing, that means there's no force there. Amen. But he says there's a condition. If I be willing, if you be willing, and be obedient. So there are two things there. If we are willing and be obedient. Can we be obedient without being willing? Or can we be can willing and not be obedient? I can be willing to do something, right? I can be willing to do something, but... When, when I'm facing with the requirements, the requirements, this is what I'm going to be abiding by. That's, that's where obedience comes from. Amen? Now, I'm willing to come, but then when I look at the requirement, now all of a sudden I, I started to think twice. So it's more than just to come to Jesus. We must be obedient. It's not just going through what, what the Bible is telling us here. It's not just going through the water of baptism and accept Jesus as I'm, I'm my personal Savior, I must be obedient after that. I must remain dead to sin. I must stop doing the things that I used to do. That, isn't that what it means? I must reflect the Christ's character now. I must uh, cease from uh, joking, from telling bad jokes. I must cease from uh, watching certain movies. I must cease from uh, entertaining myself with evil thoughts, evil entertainment. Amen? That's what it means to be obedient. Yes, I'm willing to come. I'm willing to accept Jesus as my personal Savior. But am I willing to be obedient? That's what Jesus is asking. Are you willing to be obedient? 
and uh, to be willing to be obedient. Remember, the priest is about to enter into the holy place. In the outer court, we accept Jesus as our Savior. That's like saying thank you. But are we willing to be obedient? Being obedient there means to accept Christ as my Lord as well. Because if He's the Master, if He's the Lord of my life, then uh, I must obey Him whatever He asks me to do. Wherever He wants to send me, I must be willing to do that. Amen? So we need both the will and uh, being obedient. So again, we are looking at the labor, which represents the, the burial to sin. Notice with me now, on the screen here, it represents what? The labor there, it represents the baptism, which really signifies the, the death to, to self, which represents the, the what? The death to self. Go with me now. Let's look at Jesus as our example now in uh, Matthew. Which book are we going to? We're going to the book of Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. I'll give you a moment there. A moment to get there. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Jesus was our example. Amen. And the Bible tells us that. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. And notice what the Bible says here. It says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be what? What was the reason why Jesus came to John? To be baptized of him. But notice what the Bible says in verse 14. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered, uh, said unto John, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to, to fulfill what? All uh, righteousness. Then he suffered uh, him. So Jesus came to John. John felt he was unworthy to baptize Jesus. But Jesus uh, said, uh, again, uh, suffer it to be, to be what? To be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. So according to what Jesus says here, what does baptism represent? The, you didn't see it? What does baptism represent? Righteousness. It represents righteousness, right doing. The cleansing, the cleansing of sin. Because it, it represents represent the removal of sin, the cleansing of sin, the burial of sin. That's righteousness. Amen? But was Jesus uh, a sinner? Was he guilty? No. no. That was an example for you and I. Notice what Spirit of Prophecy says here. She says, from faith I live by, conversion and the new life. On the screen there, it says, Jesus did not receive a baptism. Notice now. As a, as a what? As a confession of guilt on his own account. He identified himself with sinners. Jesus identified himself with who? That's you and I. Taking the, notice what it says there, taking the steps that we are to take. So hence, that was an example for you and I. It says, and doing the work that we must do. His life of suffering and patient endurance after his baptism was also an example to us. So according to what Sister White says here, what happened after our baptism? Does everything get better? Does life get easier? No. She says, again, his life, Jesus' life of suffering and patient endurance after his baptism. You see what happened after baptism? So we we will be living a life of what? Suffering, patient, endurance after baptism was also an example to us. Those who have been, what's the word? Buried with Christ in baptism and been raised in the likeness of His resurrection, notice now, have pledged themselves to live uh, what kind of life? A newness of life. What does it mean to live a newness of life? That means the old man is no longer in the picture. That means the things that I once enjoy, once love, I no longer enjoy or love these things. That means I no longer live for myself. That means we no longer live for ourselves. We only live for Jesus Christ. Amen? Because it's His life now that we are living. Amen? That's the commitment that we made. That's the pledge that we made. 
when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior and we went down to the water of baptism and come back, we made a pledge that I have buried this new old man in this, into this water and no longer do I want to raise him up again. If I offend the Lord, if I commit a sin, because all of a sudden it reminds me of the person I once were and the person that I need to be now in Christ Jesus. Have you ever felt this way? It's a sad reality. And, but I thank God for His mercy, His grace that He imparts into, uh, unto us each day. Regardless of what we, we do, His grace, the Bible tells us, where sin abound, what happened? Grace abound even more. I thank God for His grace. I want to keep this man buried, don't you? This old man buried. This old nature buried. This selfish man buried. Don't you want that? I want that. I want to keep that man buried and uh, let Jesus live in me. Amen? Let's go to Colossians now. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Which book are we going to? We're going to the book of Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. Colossians chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says here in Colossians chapter 2. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Notice now. So we have received the Lord Jesus Christ. So how should we walk now? We walk in Him. And the Bible goes on to say in verse 7, notice now, how we walk in Jesus Christ. So that would be the question. How do we walk in Jesus Christ. What does that mean to walk in Him? Notice verse 7. Rooted. What's the word? Rooted. When you see the word or hear the word rooted, what comes to mind? Like a tree. Amen? Like a tree planted. It has uh, its roots uh, run, run deep into the ground. Amen? rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith as He have been taught, abounding therein with uh, thanksgiving. Then uh, verse 8 tells us, Beware, lest any man spoil you through what? Philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and uh, not of whom? Not after Christ, for in Him... It, who, who is in the picture now? You, you notice that how the Bible is pointing us to Jesus. We are buried. We no longer live to self anymore, any longer. So everything now is about Jesus. So again, the Bible says, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of what? Of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in, in whom? In yourself? No, in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of, uh, of Christ. Now notice with me now verse 12. Buried, what's the word? Buried with Him. How? In baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him, through the faith of the operation of God, who have raised him from the dead. So we must stay buried, right? At least the old man must stay buried. No longer should we go back and try to, to dig that old man out of that grave, of that tomb, or wherever it is buried, brothers and sisters. Amen? So Jesus is our example, like the Bible says. So baptism represent this also represents the seeking of those things which are above, the heavenly things, like the Bible tells us. Same book, notice with me now, in chapter 3 now, beginning in verse 1. And the Bible says, If ye then be risen with Christ. Notice now, if I am risen with Christ, how can I be risen with Christ? What must happen first in order for me to be risen with Christ? I must be buried first. Amen? I'm a, I must be buried first in order to be risen with Him. Again, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are where? 
above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So that means I no longer live to myself, unto myself. I always seek what is pleasant in the sight of God or pleasing God. I, I should wake up each and every day seeking to know His will and, uh, and His uh, grace to empower me to, uh, to do His will. Amen? Because we're going to be facing with all types of obstacles, all types of uh, trials each day. And sometimes it's, uh, we feel overwhelmed. I know things or two about that. Amen? But notice with me now also in uh, another bapt baptism that the Bible referred to. So we looked at the water of baptism, what it represents. But there's a, also another kind of baptism. Whereas uh, this uh, man of sin, it shows how this man of sin must be truly annihilated in order to be risen with Christ in order to live in His presence. Let's go now to the book of uh, Matthew. Back now to the book of Matthew. Which book are we going to? Matthew. We're going to the book of uh, Matthew chapter 20. And uh, notice this other type of baptism there. So we looked at the water of uh, baptism. But here is another baptism that Jesus speaks of in order to totally, completely crucify, annihilate this uh, man of sin, this flesh. Notice now Matthew chapter 20, verse uh, Beginning uh, in uh, verse, uh, let's begin in verse uh, 20. Then came to him the mother of uh, Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. Verse 21, and he said unto her, what will thou? Notice now, she saith unto him, grant that these uh, my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Notice now, pay careful attention with what the way Jesus is answering this question. Remember, what was the question again? What was the desire of the mother of the sons of uh, Zebedee? For, right, for her sons to sit uh, at the right hand of uh, Jesus Christ. Amen? But notice how Jesus again is answering it. Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be, what's the word? Baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Notice now. Jesus, in another word, the mother of uh, the sons of Zebedee had uh, a desire to see her sons sit on the right hand of Jesus. But where is that? Speaking of heaven now. So she had this desire in her heart to see her sons in heaven, sitting next to Jesus. But Jesus, the way Jesus is answering this question here, Jesus said, it will cost you something. And this is where Jesus got into another type of a baptism. He says again, Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with? What kind of baptism? The baptism that I'm, I'm about to, I am baptized with, they said unto him, We are able. And Jesus says, And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed, notice now, of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. When Jesus says, Ye shall indeed drink of my cup, what cup is Jesus referring to here? Which cup? Jesus is referring to the, the cup that he drank. Remember when he was in the garden, brothers and sisters, when he was in the garden pleading with God, praying, what was his prayer? Who remember the prayer? Oh, my father, if this, what, what's the word that follows? If this cup, remember that? If this cup may pass away from me, if, if I have to drink this cup, thy will be done. That was the prayer. This is the same cup Jesus is referring to here. Jesus says again, Ye shall drink the indeed of my cup. That's the cup of trials. That's the cup of suffering. Remember the Bible tells us that the same way because we have accepted Jesus. Sister White just said, we read that a few moments ago. 
Sister White says, as we accept the Lord as our personal Savior, because we have accepted Him as our personal Savior, we will have to suffer like He suffered. As a matter of fact, let's go back to that quote there. She says in the red letter, she says, His life of suffering and patient endurance after His baptism was also an example for us. Was also what? An example for you and I. And so that's the cup there Jesus was referring to. Are we willing to drink of that cup? What the disciple says, we are able. And the same question is being asked to you and I. Are we, will we be willing to drink of that cup? And the time is coming when we're going to be testing, tested to see if we will endure, as Sister White says here, endure till the end. But... I do believe, brothers and sisters, if we have been truly died and buried with Jesus, we will be able to endure. We will be able to suffer for Him. Amen? But notice what the Spirit of Prophecy says here on the screen. She says, as the Protestant churches reject the clear scriptural arguments in defense of, uh, what is it? God's law. They will long to, to do what? to silence those whose faith they cannot overthrow by the Bible. So, is there a cup coming for the remnant people of God? There is a cup coming. When Jesus was referring to about this cup here, He was referring to persecution that was coming first against Him, but also against the disciples. So, the Bible tells us, Spirit of Prophecy tells us, as we see religious leaders, as we see the world moving away from uh, a thus saith the Lord, we should expect a cup of suffering, a cup of persecution coming against God's people. She goes on to say, though they blind, speaking of Protestants, though they blind their own eyes to the fact they are now adopting a course which will lead to the persecution of those who what is it? Consciously refuse to do what the rest of the Christian world are doing and acknowledge the claims of the papal Sabbath. The dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade, or compel how many classes? All classes to honor the what? The Sunday. That's from a Great Controversy 592. And that is uh, the cup of persecution that is coming upon God's people. And uh, notice uh, how this is being developed here. Like uh, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Uh, who remember this? Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. And this is coming. The dragon is already wroth with the remnant of the seed of that woman. Notice what this article says here. It says, October 12, 2016, from WND, another state tells the churches to shut up about, the, what is it, transgenders. Then it says here, it's over, a new gender identity. Definition adopted in Massachusetts, the measure makes gender identity a what? A special class with more protections than ordinary citizens. Under the provision, the Attorney General has claimed houses of worship are what? Are places of public accommodation. So they're saying that uh, we need to stop talking about uh, what the Bible says on this uh, topic uh, on uh, homosexuality and in the house of worship that we must open uh, the church's doors and bathroom so that uh, we can accommodate transgender. Then it says, and the members therefore cannot even express ideas concerning religious uh, expression regarding biological sex and uh, gender identity. And uh, all of these unjust laws, like this one here in Massachusetts, is exactly what we saw happen during Bible time. Is what's happening, is what's about to happen to God's people. A cup of persecution is coming. Notice another article here. It says, Brett Bard, October 15, 2016. It says, uh, China tells citizens to, to do what? To report parents 
who lure kids into religion. In a new set of education rules, the Chinese Communist Party is urging citizens to, to do what? To spy on their neighbors and report parents who raise their children in a religious faith or have them attend religious services. So what they're trying to do, they're trying to stop parents, especially those of us who are homeschooling our children, those of us who are teaching them about uh, the three angels' messages. Like the Waldensians, the spirit of prophecy tells us in the book Great Controversy that they taught their children, the parents taught their children, not only true education, but they taught their children how to abhor papacy. And so the papacy is the one really behind this. And so a cup of persecution is coming upon God's people. We see church and state coming together. We see all of the churches and the religions are uniting with uh, the papacy. Speaking of church and state, notice what this article says here. It says from Crooks Magazine, October 20th, 2016. Al Smith dinner reflects the church's uh, ability to bring uh, people together. But which church is it referring to here? Notice it says Thursday night, Al uh, Smith uh, dinner. In New York City, probably the last time Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump will share a stage before the election was a reminder that even in the midst of contentiousness, the Catholic, the, which church? The Catholic Church still has the ability to bring people together and offer hope in a better way of uh, engaging the world. Notice now, this was uh, just uh, two days ago, and uh, you have uh, Donald Trump uh, and Hillary Clinton, uh, which is a tradition every election year where the two parties, the two candidates uh, come together, but who is always in the middle hosting this event, uh, bringing the two parties together. This is an evening where they joke about each other, right? It's the, it's the Catholic priests. Uh, it's the Catholic Church that brings them together, which means that the Catholic Church control both parties. Amen? That's what, it's, that's what it represents. But I want you to focus here one more time in the red letters there, red words there. It says the Catholic Church still has the ability to bring people together and offer hope in a better way of engaging the world. So the Catholic Church has uh, the ability to bring people together. Now, as I read this, the thought that came to my mind uh, was that if this church, as it says here in this article, has the ability to bring people together uh, in, through errors, that's the point there, through errors, how much more can God bring us together in His truth? Amen? How much more? This, this, these folks are being deceived by this institution, by errors, but yet this organization, this church, is able to bring them together. But is, the er is error more powerful than the truth? Is uh, sin more powerful than God's grace? One more time. Where sin abound, grace abound even more. So the truth of God should bring us cl much closer together than the errors. But unfortunately, this is uh, what's happening in our world today. Notice another article here, how they're coming together. It says from Cook's Magazine again, October 17th, 2016, Pentecostal promotes what Pope calls, what is it? Walking ecumenism, praying together, the ecumenism of prayer, one for the other and all for unity. Rel relational reconciliation, a process that is, what is it? That is not about what? Doctrinal alignment. So you see how the Catholic Church is able to bring people together? How they conv con convicted or they convince other denominations to lay aside the Bible, that's what it says here, a process that is not about doctrinal alignment or theological differences among Christians. So lay aside the Bible. Let's just come together. Forget about what God says. Come together on false root, on errors. One more time. If they are able to do that, when the truth of God, the Bible tells us, brings, uh, it sanctifies, it, it brings light, 
This should bring us more closer together than the errors. And now notice another article here from Cook's Magazine, October 21st, 2016. Headline, Pope in Sweden could, bring, could break ground on intercommunion, Bishop says. This, is, uh, this meeting will happen at the end of this month, October 31st, which really will mark uh, the end of, uh, all, of uh, Protestantism. When uh, they come together to celebrate uh, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, it says, the consensus of the 1999 document on justification stated that the reasons for the Catholics condemning the Protestant position and vice versa, what, what happened? No longer hold. What does that mean? Are we Protestant? What it means is that, that Martin Luther, the whole idea of him protesting was based on the error. It was a misunderstanding. It goes on to say, and if, and if ever, each church did hold the position that the other said they did. What is now true is that neither church no longer holds that position. In other words, the Reformation was all a what? A big misunderstanding. Brothers and sisters, this is what we are looking at here in the outer court of the sanctuary. The just shall live by faith. Was that a misunderstanding? No, that was not a misunderstanding. What, what, is, uh, what was uh, the teaching of the, of the church, the Roman church back in those days? What is that teaching now? That salvation is by works. But the Bible tells us, according to what we are studying here, based on the outer court of the sanctuary, we don't deserve salvation. It is by faith we, we receive that. No works, no amount of works can... Uh, earned us salvation. Amen? Christ was the one who did the work. This is why over and over the Bible says, in Him, in Him, in Him dwell the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Because it is in Christ Jesus we find salvation. Because He did the, the work. But now we are saying, they are saying, it was all a misunderstanding. Well, is the Seventh-day Adventist church a misunderstanding because we were told that the Reformation didn't end with Luther it must continue the banner had been passed unto the Seventh-day Adventists to continue to proclaim that the just shall live by faith Christ and him only amen that we can overcome sin amen and that the papacy is the Antichrist and now notice what sister white says here she says, God never forces the will or the conscience, but Satan's constant resort to gain control of those who, who, whom he cannot otherwise seduce. That, in, that represents the, the Roman Catholic Church here. It says, it's compulsion by cruelty. Through fear of force, he endeavors to rule the conscience and to secure homage to himself. To accomplish this, he works through both religious and secular authorities, moving them to the enforcement of human laws in defiance of the law of God. So as they come together, the Catholic Church says, lay aside your doctrinal beliefs so that they can enforce human laws or human religious laws. It says, those who honor the Bible, Sabbath, would be denounced as enemies of law and order. So here is where we come in. We as Seventh-day Adventists have been called to continue the Reformation. When the Reformers, like men like Martin Luther and the others, when they discover some preci uh, precious truths from the Bible, they carry that, they take it to the world. And light came to the dark world. But we discover, this movement have also discovered not only the sanctuary message that brings more light to this dying world, but also the Sabbath truth. So now, again it says, moving them to the enforcement of human laws and defiance of the law of God. 
those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order. So in other words, if we're still keeping the Sabbath, if we're still proclaiming uh, that the Sunday is the mark of the beast and the Sabbath is the seal, is the mark of God, then uh, according to what Sister White says, we will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down uh, the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption and calling down the judgment of God upon the earth. That's great controversy, 591 and 592. And so how are they pushing for this religious law, which will go against the Sabbath commandments? How are they pushing for this? Notice what it says here from NPR. It says, nation clench, landmark, pact to fight, what is it? Climate change, that's October 15, 2016. And notice what it says here from the New York Times, October 15, 2016. It says, nations fighting powerful refrigerant that warms our planet reach a landmark deal. Do you understand what that means? If you live in a climate where the, the weather is... a mostly hot throughout the year, warm throughout the year. So they're gonna put some restriction on uh, air conditioning. Because according to what they're saying here, it's uh, killing or damaging the planet. But the point of this here, if they can uh, come up with something like this, what makes you think that uh, it will be a hard thing to legislate, to enforce a Sunday law under persecution? Notice now, it goes on to say, negotiators, from more than 170 countries reach a legally binding accord to counter climate change by cutting the worldwide use of a powerful planet warming chemical used in air conditioners and refrigerators. And notice also what our president here, Barack Obama says in regard to climate change. From the Hill, October 5th, 2016, Obama held Best shot, what is it? Best shot to save the planet as climate deal approve. So them, these measures they are taking, cutting uh, 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 carbon dioxide, C CO2, whatever you, they're saying that it's the best step towards that. But remember, this is a, a smoke screen. The name of the game is to legislate Sunday. And notice another one here from uh, The Guardian. Caring for creation makes the Christian a case for climate action. October 10th, 2016, most of you are aware of a growing movement amongst persons of faith to bring more action on dealing with climate change. The argument is powerful for the faithful. The earth is God's gift to humanity. We should care for it accordingly. So the faithful, the religions, or should I say, Protestants now, they see something in this movement, in this climate change movement that they agree upon with the state. Church and state, you see how the state is bringing the church together with them here. What have they seen that is good, that is a good thing? Legislate Sunday, a day where we can give the planet a break. Hence, the reason why the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 13, church and state will unite, will enforce the mark of the beast, and persecution will come. And uh, notice uh, in a recent uh, executive order that Obama sent out on October 13th, 2016, from the White House uh, website, coordinating efforts to prepare the nation for space weather events. Section 1 policy, it says... Uh, Space weather events in the form of solar flares, solar energetic particles, and uh, geomagnetic uh, disturbances occur regularly, some uh, with uh, measurable effects on critical infrastructure system uh, and technologies, such as the Global Positioning System, uh, GPS, satellite uh, operation and communication, uh, aviation, uh, and the electrical power grid, extreme space weather events, those that could significantly degrade critical infrastructure, 
could disable large portions of the electrical power grid, resulting in cascading failures that would affect key services such as water supply, healthcare, and transportation. And so what they're saying here, they're letting you know what they're about to do. That uh, sooner or later, one day, there's going to be an electrical power grid uh, out outage. There's going to be a lack of water. There's going to be a lack of transportation. And if we are still in the cities at this time, brothers and sisters, we will, we will get stuck there. This is why, as we see this agitation towards legislating Sunday, God is calling His people to move out of the cities into the country so that when that happens, when they legislate Sunday and enforce Sunday, God's people were already making provision, growing their own food. And this is coming. And we are seeing a great commotion, a great uh, agitation towards uh, the legislation of Sunday. Notice what this article says here. Notice what it says here in this article from Macruz Magazine, October 21st, 2016. Hindus, Muslims, and Christians ponder Pope's, uh, what is it? Eco teaching. This is referring to Laudato Si, the en encyclical on climate change that the Pope put out. It says uh, Pope Francis, he continues with this trend. This encyclical letter, Laudato Si, that he presented to all men and women of goodwill, is a call to all of us to take care of our coming house, our planet, before it's too late. So now, all the religion, including uh, Christianity, has a, a substitute Christ now. They have accepted uh, the writings of the papacy above uh, a dust, saith the Lord. And uh, notice what Sister White says here. She says, heretofore, those who presented the truths of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. As the question of enforcing Sunday observance is a wildly agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching and the third message will produce an effect which it could not have before. So we are seeing that this event that Sister White in the Bible have uh, uh, prophesied, have told us long ago, would happen, we see it developing. The agitation toward a Sunday law is right upon us. So according to what Sister White says here, as we see this agitation towards a Sunday law, which message that needs to be proclaimed with, with uh, the loudest, which message that the world needs right now is the third angel's message. It will produce an effect which it could not have before. So brothers and sisters, that's justification by faith. That, that's righteousness by faith in verity in the Jesus Christ. Because we have uh, the Antichrist who portrayed himself as the Christ. We must uplift the real Christ. But we must first be crucified to self. So that we can live as he live, As if we had been, as Paul says, risen with him. So Christ wants us to, to set us free. Set us free from what? Go to John, John chapter 8. Which book are we going to? The Gospel of John, chapter 8. Are you heading there? Okay, John chapter 8, verse 34. You see verse 30, 34? Yeah. And notice now, that Jesus makes us free, brothers and sisters. The Bible says, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth, what is it? Sin is the servant of sin. Which servant do you want to be? Or what kind of servant, I should say, what kind of servant, whom do you want to serve? Is it uh, the men of sin? Because the Bible says, if we commit sin, we are the servant of sin. But the Bible called this Antichrist the men of sin. But whom, who is the world following today? The servant of sin. Are, have we been uh, made free in Christ Jesus? Notice now. And uh, the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth uh, for how long? Ever. So if we are the servant uh, of righteousness, not the servant of sin, so the Bible says that we abide in God's house. How? Forever. Amen. Then uh, notice verse 37. 
and verse 36 rather, if the Son therefore shall make you free, what happened? Ye shall be free indeed. So the question is, are we free? Have we, made, have we been made free? Are we free? Well, sometimes we find our, ourselves entangled with, uh, uh, as a servant to sin, right? That happens sometimes, right? Sometimes we find ourselves, when we offend the Lord, when we break His commandments, when we sin against God, we become, a, one more time, a servant to sin. But thank God, brothers and sisters, for the remedy. Thank God He delayed His judgment. Amen? Thank God judgment is delayed. Thank God for His grace. If it wasn't for His grace and Him delaying His judgment to give us what? Time. The reason why judgment is delayed is not so much so that we can continue in sin. Amen? So that we can remember who we are in Christ Jesus and what? And keep that old man buried, amen, and put on Christ one more time. He says, if the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So persecution is coming. But if we have been made free, if Jesus have made me free, so I don't need to worry about this. The Sunday law is coming. The Bible and Spirit of Prophecy tells us that when that happens, the papacy will come back into power. What we, what we read about during the 1260 years will happen again to God's people. As we just quoted a moment ago, Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was rough with the woman and uh, he went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God. No matter what happened, they will keep the commandments of God. No matter what happened, they will remain dead to sin. No matter what happened, they will not try to go back because of trials and persecutions to, to what? To raise that old person again. They will keep the commandments of God to the point of death. And I want that. So we want to get to the point where we can say, I know my Redeemer liveth. And no matter what happened, when he comes again, no matter what happened, he will give me an incorruptible body. It will take me to glory. And so Sunday Lord is coming. This is the event that uh, the prophets have foretold. Sister White have foretold. And it's about to come upon God's people. We must remain dead, crucify the old man in order to stand when that crisis come upon us. Notice what this article says here. From the pilot. Here's the crisis. It says, Boston Conference to focus on the importance of Sabbath. When it talks about the Sabbath here, they're referring to Sunday. That was October 14th, 2016. Father Conroy served on the where? On the UN Advisory Committee on Environmental Sabbath World Day of Rest. Notice now, it says Environmental Sabbath world day of rest that sabbath there is referring to sunday so this is where this is the un ah understand what that means all the the nations now have signed this agreement on climate change but the un it says has what is called an environmental sabbath world day of rest this is referring to sunday as a world day of rest. What's exciting about this is the way Catholics and Evangelicals and Orthodox and all sorts of Christians are working together to do what? Notice why they're working together. They're working together to uphold the fundamental commandment to keep the holy the Sabbath. They want to keep what? Holy Sunday. They are working together. Sister White tells us that the Sunday movement is uh, rising up behind the scene. The Sunday movement is uh, spreading in darkness. And we are seeing it uh, happening uh, little by little. It says, uh, recovering uh, the theological significance of Sunday is fundamental to rebalancing our lives. Then it goes on to say, for Christians, Sunday, the Lord's Day, 
is a special day consecrated to the service and worship of God. It is a unique Christian festival. On Sunday, the church assembles to realize her ecclesiastical fullness in the Eucharist by which the kingdom and the endless day of the Lord are revealed in time. It is, uh, that's Sunday now, Sunday is the perpetual first day of the new creation, a day of rejoicing. The statement also said, so is a Sunday law coming? So once the Sunday law gets here, what is going to happen? Pretty soon we will not be able to buy or sell according to what Revelation chapter 13 tells us, verses 15 through 17, unless we are willing to bow on Sunday to worship uh, the, the papacy. And so they will come up with a system now to regulate, uh, to make sure that they know when we buy and when we sell. And notice what uh, this article says here. From a financial review, October 17, 2016, why a cashless society would be a nightmare. Uh, a claim is only as good as its enforceably, enforceability and in, a cash, cash, and in a cashless society, every transaction must pass through a financial gatekeeper. So every transaction now will have to go through a gatekeeper to whether to, uh, whether to approve it or not. Hence, uh, they will be able to re regulate the buying and the selling. Banks, being a private institution, have the right to refuse transactions at their direct discretion. We can't expect every payment to be given due process. This means that politi politically unpopular organizations could easily be deprived of economic assets. Hence the call to leave the cities, to go to the country and start growing our own food. Amen? Again, it says, this means that politically unpopular, notice now, the word unpopular, according to the Bible, the disciples were unpopular. According to the Bible and spiritual prophecy, the remnant of the seed of the woman will be unpopular. So when that happened, this means that politically unpopular organization could easily be deprived of economic access. That means they will not be able to buy and sell because according to what's happening, there will be a universal government, a one world order. And notice this last article here. It says uh, from uh, Vatican Radio, Vatican Universal Jurisdiction is an important tool. September 11th, 2016. It could be an important tool to ensure accountability and prevent the impunity in case of serious violation of international humanitarian law and uh, human rights. So the human law, this is what they are upholding right now. They are putting human laws above uh, the laws uh, of God. Then it goes on to say, and to offer redress to victims, said uh, Archbishop uh, Barnardito uh, Ahusa, the payment observer of the Holy See to the United Nations when traditional bases of jurisdiction are unable to address some uh, heinous crimes and when no international tribunal has com competent universal, what is it? Yeah. Universal jurisdiction could become a necessary tool. So what that means, brothers and sisters, there would be a one world order. Amen? One world order. That's a new government. So there will be a one world order. Go with me now to the book of uh, Romans uh, chapter 6. Which book are we going to? Romans uh, chapter 6. No, look with me now in the book of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Again, uh, let's look at that passage one more time. The Bible says uh, that we must remain uh, buried uh, in, uh, in Christ Jesus. We must uh, put away sin so that Christ can live in us. And if Christ lives in us, as the disciple says, we are able to drink that cup 
Jesus says, indeed, you'll be able to drink it. The only way we can drink this cup, if we abide and remain in Jesus. It says again in verse 8, Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth, what is it? No more. Christ raised from the dead, he dieth, what? No more. What does that mean? That means once we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, we crucified the flesh, we buried Him uh, through the water of the baptism. That means, brothers and sisters, we are now alive spiritually. We, this corruptible body may die. Amen? This corruptible body may die, but we are alive in Christ Jesus. Why? Because He is now in the presence of the Father, making intercession for us. Because it's His life that we're living. We no longer live unto ourselves. We're no longer living for ourselves. So we are alive in Him. It says, uh, verse 9, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, Death have no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto what? Unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, notice the counsel there. Likewise, reckon ye your also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. If I am dead to sin, if we are dead to sin, we are living, how? According to what the Bible says, unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, brothers and sisters, if we are alive, but we are not dead to sin, what happened to us? We may be alive physically, but spiritually we are dead. What's more important, being alive spiritually or being alive physically? Being alive spiritually. Because if we are alive spiritually now, Jesus says, the Bible says, when He comes again, amen, hallelujah, when He comes again, He will give us a, a new body. That's a physical body. And the Bible tells us, the same body that Jesus had, we will have as well. When He came out of that tomb anew, He buried the old body. He came out with a new body. And the Bible goes on to say in verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the water, in the lust thereof, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So that's telling me everything about me must be surrendered to God in order to be alive with Jesus Christ. Everything about me must be crucified. Everything about me must be buried because we don't want to uh, sin to have dominion over us, as verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under water, under grace. And uh, grace is power to resist temptation, to overcome sin, to overcome uh, temptations, to overcome uh, trials. Go to Colossians now, Colossians chapter 2. Go back to the book of Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. And the Bible says uh, again, As ye therefore receive Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as ye there as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Verse 9, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principalities and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, 
buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through faith of the apparition of God, who have raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all, how many? All your trespasses. And so God has forgiven us. When we say, Jesus, I want to serve you. I accept what you have done for me. And I want to go down to the water of baptism. That represents uh, the burial of my sins and of your sin. That means we have been quickened to live in Christ Jesus. Amen. Notice what the uh, spirit of prophecy says here. She says, as uh, a Christian submits to the solemn uh, Right of baptism, the three highest powers in the universe, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, place their approval on His act, pledging themselves to exert their power in His behalf as He strives to honor God. He is what? He is buried in the likeness of Christ's death and uh, is raised uh, in the likeness of what? Of His uh, resurrection. He went down into the grave, but he rose from the dead, proclaiming over the rent sepulcher, I am the what? The resurrection and the life. Manuscript releases, volume 6, page 26. And another quote here. She says, we must have less trust in what we ourselves can do and more trust in what the Lord can do for and through us. You are not in to engage in your own work, you are doing the work of God. So render how much uh, your will and way to Him. Make not a single reverse, reserve, not a single compromise with self. Know what is to be free in Christ. What is to be free in Christ Jesus? It is the surrender of self, as Sister White says here. We must uh, make no compromise, she says, uh, with self. So we must learn what is to be free in uh, Christ Jesus. Let's close up uh, with this passage there from Colossians. Again, going back to the book of Colossians again. We're going to close there with the book of Colossians uh, chapter 3. Notice now, if we have been uh, crucified with Jesus Christ, we're no longer living for self. The selfishness, everything about us have been crucified, have been buried into that tomb. Notice what the Bible describes who we are now in Christ Jesus. We, are, we become a new creature. Notice now, it says in verse 12 of Colossians chapter 3, Put on therefore, amen? Put on therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of what? Mercies. To put on now, bowels of mercies. That means we are willing to forgive each other no matter what happened. Amen? Amen? No matter what happened. Put on, therefore, bowels of mercy. What's the next word that follow? What's the next word that follow after bowels of mercy? Kindness. Put on, therefore, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and uh, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ, notice now, Forgive you, so also do ye. So no matter what happened, because we are a new creature in Christ Jesus, we're no longer living for self, because it's Christ that liveth in me. No matter what I have done to you, no matter what you have done to me, I must find the grace in my heart. I must ask God to help me to crucify that flesh who is preventing me or tempting me from forgiving you. I must, put, I must put on bowels of mercy and I must reflect Jesus Christ. Verse 14, and above all things, put on charity, which is, which is what? Which is uh, the bond uh, of perfectness. And uh, what is charity? It is love. And the Bible says love will cover a multitude of sins. And let the peace of God rule in your heart, to the which also ye are called in one body and be what? And be thankful. So, we have been buried in Christ Jesus. And uh, we must put on Christ. The same way he came out of the tomb. 
in the likeness of his resurrection, the apostle says. So we must leave that man, that old man buried, and let Christ live in us because it is his life that we are living. You know why? Because in the Garden of Eden, you and I deserve to die, to deserve to be annihilated. But thank God for grace. God gave us another opportunity. God gave us uh, another chance. He sent the seed to live the life we should have lived in our behalf, as our example. And so, out of gratitude, we must be willing to drink the cup that He drank and live the life that He lived and let Him be glorified in us and then let Him be sh reflect in all that we do and say. So, brothers and sisters, that's how heaven will be like. Heaven will be a place where selfishness will be even a word that is never heard of. A, a place where we get along together. Uh, but we must have that mindset here on earth before we can live in His presence. Let's pray. Our Father which art in heaven, Father, forgive us of our trespasses, of our many trespasses. Forgive us, Father, for our selfishness. Forgive me, Father, of my sins. Cleanse me, O Lord. I want to be with you. We all have this desire to be with you, Lord. Help us to keep this man, this old man buried and not go back to dig him out. Help us to live in Jesus Christ, put on Christ. Father, thank you for speaking to us. And help us, Father, to put these things in practice. Help me to put these things in practice that you have shared with us here so we can have a little heaven here on earth so that when we get to heaven, it will be something that we've already been acquainted with, used to, to live as Jesus lived and to live as the angels and the rest of the unfalling world are living right now. We pray that we will uphold Jesus in everything that we do. In His name we pray. Amen.